Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Community Church. I know a lot of people are out there, so maybe when they hear my voice, they may come trickling in. But good morning and welcome. We are so excited that you're here and worshiping with us this morning. In a few minutes, Pastor Jeremy... Whoa, that was a throwback. <laughs> Pastor Robert is going to be leading us in prayer. If you have a prayer request for him, would you please pull out that prayer request card and the seat back in front of you, fill it out and send it to the center aisle, or you can text him. His phone number is right on the front of your bulletin, and you can give him your prayer request to share with the congregation. Also, when you leave today, if you want to give an offering, a monetary gift to the church, there's an offering basket right at the end of this center aisle. So we ask that if you want to do that, we appreciate it. And it goes towards maintenance of the building. It goes to ministries. It goes to uh, taking care of our community. So if you want to give to the church, the af basket is right back there. I want to point out that today after worship, immediately after worship in the fellowship hall, Pastor Robert is going to be um, giving us some information about where the United Methodist uh, Church is headed, uh, the history of where we're headed with the, uh, with the discussion of same-sex marriage and same-sex issues. So if you have questions about what's going to be happening, uh, what might happen to the United Methodist Church and maybe this church, go ahead and meet downstairs. And then next Sunday, again, right after church, we're going to have a dialogue about uh, what you learned today and what you heard today. So if you're interested in that information, meet downstairs right after worship. And Pastor Robert will be leading that. Also, uh, we have a movie night coming up um, on March 12th, 11th, 12th. 6.30, right here, a family movie night, just a fun time, free popcorn, pizza, lots of fun things to do. It's a great time for uh, young families. It's a good time for anyone that wants to come. It's going to be showing a movie uh, called American Underdog. So if you are interested in seeing that and coming with us, that's March 12th. And finally, I want to have Kim Wood come up here. She's going to introduce us to a new member of our church that I think is probably the cutest new member of our church ever. <laughs> Do you want to take it away, Kim? You want to explain to him who Hudson is? Yes. Uh, Hudson is a standard poodle puppy. He's eight weeks old, and his grandma, will, you, will his grandma please raise her hand, actually helped birth him. Um, Doug and I will be raising uh, Hudson for the next 12 to 14 months to be a pause with a cause service dog. So he'll be with us training for a year and then he will actually go to prison for a year because in West Michigan we have inmates who train them in the advanced settings. Um, we're really excited to have him, but in order to be the kind of dog he's going to be, he needs to be in institutional settings and around. So you will see him around church, and probably this is the only time I'll be able to lift him because he's a standard poodle, and he weighs 11 pounds already. But um, Janice and Brad Hillary raised the mother dog. So they have Alpine, who is his mother, and this is her second litter, I think, third litter. And then they raise these puppies and then give them to people. So Bobby was actually there when Hudson was born. He was Mr. Red. And um, if you're not comfortable with dogs, give me the high sign because he has already greeted half the people in the sanctuary. So thanks. Thanks, Kim. And so now, would you please stand? You can have a chance to maybe meet Hudson. But go ahead and greet those around you and welcome them to worship this morning.
Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. He has done great things. He has done great things. He has done great things. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. He has done great things, he has done great things, he has done great things, bless his holy Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God. The vilest defender who truly believes That moment from Jesus a pardon receives Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the earth hear his voice Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the people rejoice Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory great things he has done. Be seated, please. Children can go with Miss Wendy. Good morning. So there is a wonderful hymn in the little black hymnal supplement at the end of your pews called Praise the Source of Faith and Learning. I first encountered this hymn as part of the opening convocation ceremony at the beginning of our school years at seminary. And for the most part, 
This hymn beautifully portrays how faith and reason are not forces that are opposed to each other, but gifts that God has given us equally to build and support one another. I say for the most part because there is one line in the song that doesn't sit well with me. It says, May our learning curb the error which unthinking faith can breed, lest we justify some terror with an antiquated creed. Now, obviously, I don't want us to have an unthinking faith. The Methodist movement has always combined the passions of our heart with the reason of our minds, and having questions is not a sign of doubt, but an expression of desiring to know our God more closely than we already do. And obviously, I don't want our faith to be one that causes terror to people. God's message of good news is a reflection of God's polar attributes of love and justice. Our faith should provide protection from the terrors of the world, not increase them. But where I do have issue is in the implication that the reciting of creeds is somehow related to a terrifying faith or an unthinking faith. Which brings me to today's liturgy question. Why do we say a creed or an affirmation of faith as part of our response to hearing the word of God? First, in contrast to the implications of the lyric that I've just read, our creeds are not meant to cultivate an unthinking faith, but to serve as a source of learning and education. The two well-known historic creeds, the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed, our means of quickly learning and articulating what it is that we believe as Christians. Devised at a time in human history when most people were illiterate, these creeds could be spoken aloud and memorized so that everyone in the church could understand and share our most fundamental teachings. Not only do these creeds describe the Holy Trinity by naming and describing God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, but they illustrate the nature and the works of the Trinity. In so doing, they also serve as a primer to the entire story of our scriptures. If one knows and takes to heart the creeds of the church, then one essentially has an ancient cliff notes of the Bible. Even for those of us alive today in an era of widespread literacy, the creeds can continue to serve an educational purpose by teaching us the fundamentals of Scripture and helping us through repetition and practice to encounter the light of revelation again and again. This brings me to my second point, which is that the creeds also serve as a marker of Christian unity. John Wesley famously asked in his sermon, The Catholic Spirit, Catholic here meaning universal, as it does when we say it in our creeds, though we cannot think alike, may we not love alike, May we not be of one heart, though we are not of one opinion. And while it may sound on the surface of it like John is embracing some form of relativism, what goes unstated are the foundations of Christian faith that he takes for granted. To be of different opinion for John has to do with things like the mode of our worship or the denomination to which we belong. To those who are driven to and fro and tossed with the wind of every doctrine, John cautions that they should go first and learn the first elements of the gospel of Christ, and then you shall learn to be of a truly Catholic spirit. So John isn't saying that anything goes in the tent of Christianity, but neither is he saying that there's no room for dissent or disagreement. He would have no question that if one stands in the Christian tradition, then one affirms a belief in things like the Holy Trinity, that Jesus is our one true Lord, that Christ was resurrected from the dead and promises us bodily resurrection as well, that the scriptures are authoritative and that human beings are born into sin and in need of God's redeeming grace. Now, I don't want to say that every Christian denomination could agree upon these fundamental concepts because there's probably an exception out there, but nearly every Christian tradition can agree to the kinds of things that I've just named. And you may have also noticed that these foundational concepts are largely addressed in our creeds. So when we recite the creeds, we join with the communion of saints, past, present, and future, in one common faith. In times of division such as ours, it's important 
to be reminded of what are the most essential items of faith and what are not, to have clear metrics of those few things on, on which, uh, which are essential to our agreement and our understanding of the world, and those which are more open to interpretation and investigation. If we forget the essentials that bind us together and we confuse our opinions with doctrine, then we open the door to letting our love grow cold for one another. This function of reminding us of our essential unity in the body of Christ, therefore, may be the most important function of the creeds. They empower us to continue to grow more perfect in love and to seek that state of Christian perfection toward which God is leading us. So, having said that, I'm now going to invite Mark to come on up and lead us in our call to worship this morning. Good morning. Please join in our call to worship. Happy are those who turn away from wickedness. Happy are those who delight in the law of the Lord. Happy are we who meditate in God's love. We are planted like trees by streams of water. God's love will bring our fruits to blossom. The Lord watches over the righteousness. Amen. Please open our hearts and our minds to our opening prayer. God, your words of love and justice are good news for all people. When we are affiliated, let us find comfort in you. When we are comfortable, let us be gently pushed outside our comfort zone. Draw us near to the poor and the marginalized, in whom we will see your face. Amen. Our first scripture this morning is from Jeremiah 17, 5 through 10. Thus says the Lord, Cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and make mere flesh their strength, whose hearts turn away from the Lord. They shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when relief comes. They shall live in parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green. In the year of the drought it is not anxious, and it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is devious above all else. It is perverse. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart to give all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. This is the word of God for the people of God. Come now to the time that we take each week to lift ourselves up in prayer before God, prayers for ourselves and prayers for others. So if you have prayer requests this morning, would you please pass those to the center aisle? Um, and I'm going to invite you to a few moments of silent prayer uh, as I collect your prayers this morning.
Lord of love. Tomorrow we will celebrate a feast day of one of your saints. As the secular world celebrates romantic love, let us remember the selfless, courageous love that made Valentine a faithful witness to you. A love that disrupted order for the sake of peace. A love that challenged the status quo for the sake of your kingdom. A love that could transform the world in your image. Lord, let that kind of love prevail within our hearts and within our world. Lord, we celebrate that love as Deb offers up prayers of thanks on the safe birth of her granddaughter, Marin May, to Kelly and Tim. And Lord, we trust that that love will be there to comfort those who are in need of your care. So we pray this morning for someone in need of an ankle surgery and for someone who is reaching the final stages of cancer. God, we trust that your powerful love is at work in moments of joy, is at work in moments of sorrow, and is at work in moments where it seems there is no love, in those places in the world where there is conflict and hatred, we know that your love is working subtly, invisibly, to move us ever closer to your kingdom, the kingdom that your son came and walked among us to show us. And Lord, while he was with us, he taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our second scripture this morning is from 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 20. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if this is true, that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. This is the word of God for the people of God. This song is new to most of us, so why don't you stay seated? It's pretty simple, and I think you'll like it. Goodness is 
stronger than evil. Love is stronger than hate. Light is stronger than darkness. Life is stronger than death. Victory is ours. Victory is ours. Through him who loved us. Victory is ours. Victory is ours. Through him who loved us. Goodness is stronger than evil. Love is stronger than hate. Light is stronger than darkness. Life is stronger than death. Victory is ours. Victory is ours. Through him who loved us. Victory is ours. Victory is ours. Through him who loved us. Amen. Amen. Friends, before I get to our third scripture lesson this morning, I have to ask your forgiveness. I'm still getting used to uh, checking the phone for prayer requests. So to our prayers this morning, we add continued prayers for the Durga family um, who lost their daughter at the age of five. Now, our third scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 6, verses 17 through 26. He came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets, the gospel of the Lord. Lord Author of life, we thank you for your word, and we ask that your spirit would be with us this morning to transform us in heart and mind and soul. Amen. As we've been journeying through this season of Epiphany, we've been hearing about the ways that God has been revealed to us through the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. We've seen deeds that demonstrate God's miraculous power on the banks of the River Jordan and during a wedding celebration at Cana. We've heard words of judgment and salvation in a synagogue in Nazareth and the temple in Jerusalem. Now, In Luke's telling of the Sermon on the Plain, we're reminded of the essential unity between proclamation and form, word, and deed. And before we can really get into the words that Jesus preached, we have to fix in our minds the reality of that lived moment. We can't take to heart the full value of his message without first taking to heart the fullness of the environment in which it was preached You see, it was no historical accident that Jesus was born to an unwed maiden from the wrong side of the tracks in a land that was under military occupation. 
Jesus could have been born to anyone. The Holy Spirit could have no doubt found a number of willing servants like Mary to be the bearer of God. So why then, as the Christ hymn from Philippians teaches us, did God choose to empty himself, taking the form of a slave when he was born in human likeness? Why did God, with all the power of heaven to wield, choose instead to have, inhabit a body empty of worldly power? Because the message and the material conditions in which the message are delivered and received cannot be separated from one another. The good news of the gospel sounds like good news to Mary because she awaits the day when God will cast down the powerful and lift up the lowly. She awaits the day when the hungry will be filled and the rich sent away empty. She awaits the day when the order of things will be undone so that God's vision can be fulfilled. Mary is ready and willing to be a faithful servant, to carry the child of God within her precisely because of who she was and where she lived. Imagine if instead the angel Gabriel had visited the wife of some powerful Roman senator. Imagine how that conversation might have gone. For the sake of an example, let's imagine that this woman is named Claudia, a common name in Roman times, and Gabriel appears and says, Hey, Claudia, don't be afraid, but the Holy Spirit is going to give you a son who will be called the Son of the Most High. He's going to sit on the throne of David, and his kingdom will have no end. Well, first, there's likely to be some question as to which God, this being, claims to represent. And then when the angel responds that he serves the one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Claudia is likely to go, wait, that God that the Judeans worship? Who cares about some backwater God? I don't care about being the queen of some tiny little kingdom when my husband's involved in ruling the entire Mediterranean. But maybe... For the sake of the example, Claudia is more open-minded, and she says, okay, well, tell me more about this son. What's he supposed to do? And Gabriel then explains, well, he's going to cast down the rich and the powerful. He's going to free the slaves. He's going to make the first last and the last first. How could this possibly sound like good news to Claudia? The angel Gabriel would have just described a nightmare scenario to her. She is the rich and powerful. She probably has slaves herself that help maintain her household. She is among the first families in the entire world. The good news of the gospel would seem like nothing but bad news for her. And there's a reason that Jesus was crucified. Crucifixion was a punishment for political dissidents. It was gruesome and public to set an example to anyone else who might upset the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. The sermon on the plain would sound like a political manifesto to any well-to-do Roman who heard it. It would sound revolutionary. It would sound like the kind of thing that, if left unchecked, would lead to rebellion among the Judeans, a people with a history of rebellion who are primed for another uprising. Jesus' good news to the poor sounds like bad news to everyone else. Or at least it would seem to be. It would seem to be if the only lens through which we viewed the world was the lens of our material possessions. And here it seems important for us to pause for a moment and consider that although we are separated from the life of Christ by two millennia, our world is not all that different. Humans are humans after all, and even though technology advances and the appearance of things may shift, our ways of living with each other have not evolved all that much. For example, did you know that in the Roman world, if you were busy going about your day and you needed to grab some food to eat, you could swing by your nearest quick service restaurant, go through the first century version of a drive through order your food at a window, have it handed to you, and be on your way. But more to the point, 
our economic and political systems have not changed as much as we might like to think that they have. We might tend to think of ancient Rome as a place where slavery was ubiquitous, but of our own time as a place where slavery is a vestige of antiquity clinging on in the dark corners of our world. But the reality is that there are an estimated 40 million people in slavery today, more people than at any other point in human history. And another piece of that truth is that although sex trafficking is perhaps the aspect of modern day slavery that gets the most attention, the vast majority of people enslaved today are in sectors such as agriculture, construction, manufacturing, and domestic labor. There's no telling how much our own lives have been enriched by slavery because we have become more sophisticated in the ways that we hide our slaves. But everyone living in a developed country has, in one way or another, benefited from slavery. From the food that we eat to the electronics that we use, our lives are invariably tangled up in the enslavement of others. And suddenly, we might start to realize that we're sounding an awful lot like the folks to whom Jesus proclaims woe. But slavery is such a large issue, and it's so often invisible to us. So let's consider for a second the state of poverty in the world, something a little more visible. Maybe we look at the conditions of the poor around us and we think, well, certainly today the poor are better off than the poor in Jesus' time. After all, I can turn on the TV or boot up the computer and find a news story somewhere about welfare fraud. You may have even heard someone say things like, the poor today don't even realize how good they have it, while hardworking people are out there earning their way in the world. I mean, it's not like in Jesus' day when the poor people were living in, oh wait, what, what was the life for the poor like in Jesus' day? Archaeologists from the Smithsonian have investigated this very question they wanted to find out what the inequality gap has been like throughout history. And what they found is that over time, as technology has made our lives more, or more efficient, that the inequality gap has actually increased. In other words, the poor today are further removed in their lives from the rich than was the case under the pharaohs in ancient Egypt, under the emperors in Rome, or under the kings and queens of feudal Europe. The haves today have more than they've ever had, and by comparison, the have-nots have less than they've ever had. But what does this have to do with the Sermon on the Plain? Have I gotten up here this morning just to proclaim, woe is us? Well, no, not, not entirely anyways. I want us to see the connection between the lived reality of Jesus' incarnation and the good news that he proclaimed. I want us to realize that the church, the body of Christ in the world today, has to have that same connection, that same essential unity in how we are embodied in a world and the message that we proclaim. For a long time, the church, especially the church in America, has been more like our fictitious Claudia than our blessed Mary. We've gotten used to having material wealth. We've gotten used to having political power. We've gotten used to being a dominant force in society. So when we hear that the future of the church will not look like the past of the church, it can sound a little bit like bad news. There can be an instinct within us to become defensive at suggestions that we might need to spend more time moving outside of our walls. There can be fear or anxiety about what it might mean to give up some of the things that have been so comfortable to us. There can be doubt that in reaching out in new ways, we're remaining faithful to the work and beliefs of our parents and our grandparents. But we are the body of Christ in the world. And if we are to be faithful to our one Lord, then we have to let go of those fears, doubts, and anxieties. 
We have to be willing to trust that if we empty ourselves of the things that bring us value in the eyes of the world, that we'll be found faithful to God. God isn't worried about our reputations. God is worried about making a difference in the lives of the people who need it. I know that doing that can be scary, but that is the work of faith. And by the way, in case you aren't aware, that word faith that we use in the English language, it comes from the Greek word pistis, which means something more like loyalty and trust. So for us to step out on faith, to empty ourselves of our power and our prestige, just as Christ did, is to trust that God is going to find new ways to work through us. Some of you have heard me talk about this already, and some of you are engaged in this type of work already. But the mission model of the Michigan Conference is to encourage us to move away from thinking of mission as something that we do to other people, and instead think of it as something that we do with other people. As I've listened to Doug and Nick talk with the youth group about the annual service project to Appalachia, one of the things that I have heard them stress is that it's a relational ministry first and foremost. And along the way, as we form relationships, we also happen to fix up people's homes. So, as we walk together as a church and as we figure out what the next step is that God is calling us to, I encourage you to be open to stepping out on faith, to bringing something new beyond the walls of our building that will bring us closer into relationship with our neighbors. It's what Jesus would do if he was standing among us today. And as the body of Christ, that makes it the thing that we ought to do too. Amen. Please pray with me. God, you made perfect your revelation through your Son, Jesus the Christ, because you know that all the power in the universe means nothing if it isn't used in loving relationship to help those in need. Give us the same loving, and loving spirit that inspired you to draw so close to us so that we might draw closer to one another. Give us ears to hear beyond the woes of change so that we might fully embrace the good news of your perfect kingdom. Amen. And now, would you please stand as you're able for our affirmation of faith, the ecumenical version of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And would you please remain standing as we sing together our closing hymn, Rescue the Perishing. Oh, they are 
siblings in Christ, may you go forth from this place and empty yourselves so that the Holy Spirit might fill you and that all the world might see in you the body of Christ in the world. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.